On today's show, the various ways that Ime Odoka has helped turn this Houston Rockets organization around, how Alperin Shingun and Jalen Green are thriving in their new roles because of Ime Odoka, and should he be in the running for Coach of the Year, his odds at the award, and so much more. It's all coming up right here at Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. Throw it up to Jalen Green! Shingun here in the short row. Oh my, that's the no look! Jabari for three and the win! Yeah! Look at Tarisen! Here comes Tarisen! Oh! T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. The Houston Rockets select Amen Thompson and Cam Whitmore. One thing I have never done is not made the playoffs, and so we want to take that step here as well. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked On Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked On NBA Mondays. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin and the show, of course, at Locked On Rockets. Free and available wherever you listen to your podcasts, including YouTube. Now today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. And as always, thank you so much for making Locked On Rockets part of your day every single day. Whether it's on your way to work, on your lunch break, in the gym, thank you for being an everyday. Or thank you for making Locked On Rockets part of your day every single day. Joining us now is good friend of the program and one of my fellow hosts over at Rockets Watch, none other than the Mastodon himself, Roosh Williams. You can follow on Twitter at Roosh Williams. Man, it's been a minute, but we got you back on the program, my guy. Yeah, thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Uh, happy to talk Rockets for the first time in a long time. So, yeah, let's do it. Look, and the guy that we want to spend a lot of time talking about on today's episode is none other than Ime Odoka, the guy who is... I feel like we can almost, we can't quite say single-handedly turn the organization around, but it's pretty close to that. But you also think about all the different people that Ime has in positions to help him succeed, right? And the way that he's empowered players on this roster and all that. So I don't want to say single-handedly, but the catalyst for the Rockets turning things around this season is absolutely Ime Odoka. It starts and stops with him. I'll put it like this. If we had the exact same roster, and I told you the head coach was either Steven Silas or let's say Frank Vogel. Would you have as much confidence in the team as you do now? Absolutely not. There you go. That's yeah. really all you got to say. There we so. go. Look, I mean, I, I've been able to share some of my early impressions, early thoughts uh, about Ime here, Roosh. Give me your kind of just early, you know, 10,000 foot bird's eye view takeaway about what Ime has done for this organization. I don't think we can cover it adequately in, in the time frame that we have. I mean, look. <laughs> You see, you see a complete culture shift, right? You see the guy, I mean, you see the players themselves talking about structure and accountability and how, you know, things are, are tougher. They're being held to a higher standard. And look, obviously the Rockets were tanking for three seasons. That is not a surprise to anyone. Everyone knows that. We understand. However, um, you can build those same types of habits and you can instill that culture and that accountability even even with a young roster that's going to lose games and going to tank for you effectively, right? So so that's what was missing. I mean, you, it feels like there's an adult in the room. Everything we were promised about the stature, about, you know, how people respect him, how his message resonates with the players. Like, you think about what he did in Boston, and we talk about how it took a long time. But you also have to remember that was a veteran roster uh, with dudes that, that had already, you know, been to the Eastern Conference Finals a few times. So maybe it took longer for that message to resonate. With these young guys, they are absorbing it immediately. Fred Van Vliet and Dylan Brooks have embraced it, and it's it's a full go. You know, I remember talk, earlier this season I was talking to uh, one of the players' agents, and he basically likened it to this group of guys was in such desperate need of some type of structure, some type of identity, that they were kind of craving it when Ime arrived and brought with him his own identity, his own vision for this team, almost to the point where it was like where it was like he was working with a blank canvas. So kind of big, piggybacking off your point where with a more veteran group, an established group, a group that kind of already had an identity playing under Brad Stevens, it probably took a little while to kind of transition away from the Brad Stevens self Celtics into the Ime, Udo Ime Udoka Celtics, whereas this Rockets team is, didn't really have an identity. And you've got guys now like Jabari Smith Jr., who was on FanDuel TV the other day talking about how, you know, Ime has really turned things around for this team. Um, Just togetherness, you know what I'm saying? Like, we're just coming out with that with that fight. You know, we lost a lot of games last year. And, and bringing in Coach, uh, Coach Udoka, like, he just don't like to lose. You know what I'm saying? That was his biggest thing, like, <laughs> 
play to win, play for each other, and um, that's what we're doing. You know what I'm saying? It's working out for us. Um, I would say just culture. You know, like everybody knows how he is as a person and how how serious he is and how and just his approach to the game, his competitive and his competitiveness. So I feel like he's just bringing that to us. You know, with the guys he brought in, like uh, Dylan Brooks and, and and Fred Van Vliet, just their demeanor and their how they how they go about the game. You know, what I'm saying it's just rubbing off on everybody else. It's just it's just working. What's, What's the biggest difference been from last season under Steven Silas and, and this year with Ime Udoka? Um, biggest difference. I would say just it's not as much looseness. You know, I, I would say I would say it's a lot more a lot more strict, a lot more um I'm trying to look for the right word. Structure, I would say. <clears throat> structure, structure, accountability. Um, a lot more of that, you know what I'm saying? And that comes with, with, with veterans and, and taking the pressure off of the coach a little bit, you know what I'm saying? So you know, um, with all of that coming in and just, just, just helping, you know, just make it easier for everybody. Yeah, so Jabari Smith Jr. highlighting a lot of the points that, we, that we've brought up here, a lot of the points that we kind of were discussing in the offseason and a, kind of the, the transition from the Silas era of this team to now the Udoka era of the Houston Rockets. Yeah, I mean, look, he talked about looseness, right? And to me, that's that says, okay, you can have great ideas. And I'm sure Steven Silas had great ideas. He's obviously gifted at knowing the game of basketball. But instilling, executing the instilling of your ideas, totally different ball game. And obviously, that was lacking structure. Um, you know, you don't need a drill sergeant necessarily, but you need somebody that has that, that cachet, that has that ability to, their words mean something. And they don't have to threaten you. They don't have to do anything. You just know when he says something, I got to listen to coach. If you've ever played sports, right? Like when you have a coach that's, that everyone can kind of goof off in practice and make jokes about the coach and like no one takes them seriously, those teams don't really, they're not usually good. You struggle to compete, right? Why? Because teams are generally a reflection of their head coach just in terms of the identity that you take on. It's extremely important. It's why people are always hunting for good coaches. So, and also to your point about talking to agents, I mean, you know, I talked to some players um, last season and no one has bad things to say about Steven Silas, uh, you know, as far as a human being, but multiple of them will tell you, you know, I just don't know if he's the guy to lead us to that next level, right? And you're seeing Ime Udoka clearly is, it's almost Spursian, not, I, I, won't, I don't know about the behind the scenes culture with Ime Odoka, but the product on the court and the buy-in that he's collectively gotten from the players, Spursian. No, it, well, it, I mean, it makes sense, right? He's a product of the Greg Popovich coaching tree. He went and poached former player and, and fellow coach Tiago Splitter. A lot of the guys that, you know, are on Ime's coaching staff also have roots that have, you know, spent some time with the San Antonio Spurs. And it, it's, he basically, it is kind of Spursian, especially when you look at the, equal opportunity approach that he has preached. Now, obviously the Spurs had some future Hall of Famers, legends, greats, you know, in Tim Duncan and, and Tony Parker, Manu, um, David Robinson before them, all of that. But at the same time, they were always, it always felt like they were the collection where the, the, the sum was greater than the whole of their parts, right? Where they coalesced, they came together and were able to achieve things. Even in the, the waning twilight years of the big threes career in San Antonio, they were still able to win a title against the Miami Heatles because... Greg Popovich had that team kind of playing connected, cohesive team basketball, which is something that it feels like the NBA is kind of trending more that direction now than it ever has, you know, in the last 10, 15 years or so. Yeah. I mean, look, people talk a lot about, oh, the, the you know, we need to trade for a star. And I think a lot of people have been in that mindset because of the last, whatever, however many years, basically since, I mean, the Celtics did it first, but then LeBron and the Heatles took it like to the next level and the Warriors made it even more absurd than that. And that became the model, hunt for the three big, for the big three, right? Um, but people forget that that Spurs team won a championship in 2014. And yeah, they had Duncan and Parker and Ginobili, but those guys were old at that time. They weren't like superstars like that. They and Kawhi was on the team. come up too, so there's that. But, but, but he was on the come up. He wasn't like Kawhi Leonard, right? Um, so just putting that out there. Because um, look, you've seen, you've seen it with the Rockets. They're, getting, they're winning games right now with guys like Aaron Holiday, who's a career journeyman, Jayshon Tate you know, hard hustle player, um, Jeff Green, 37 years old. Like, they're winning games like this. You remember with the Spurs, someone could sit and they would just plug someone in and that guy would just keep keep things rolling. It's like they never skipped a beat regardless of who was missing. And you're getting that. And I think that that speaks to Udoka um, instilling, you know, a system and a philosophy and a mentality of next man up, like, like you said, play for your teammates and just get it done. And that's what they're doing. They're executing. I'll say this. Every possession, nobody takes a possession off. 
That's a good way. Both to sides of the it. floor. No one takes a possession off, and it's hard to lose or it's hard to beat a team despite the talent differential when they are just in your grill possession after possession after possession. You know, even when they go down, they keep fighting. This team so far nine, nine games through the season, they keep fighting and they make comebacks. Right? They did it against the Warriors. They did it against the Pelicans. Um, the Nuggets. There were like ten different times where I thought the Nuggets were going to stuff them and, and pull away. It didn't happen. So. This team has a, a resiliency that I do think is a, is a true reflection of their head coach, of their leader in Ime Udoka. But coming up, want to continue the discussion about Ime Udoka, how he's gotten the most out of Jalen Green and Alperin Shingun this season, how those two guys are now thriving in year three of their respective careers. And then the odds for Ime Udoka to win coach of the year. I mean, it very much it's very much on the table at this point. Who does he have to beat out to win the award? What are his chances of walking away with the honor this season? We're going get, to get to all of that and so much more in just one moment. First, today's episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Look, this time of year can be a lot. I know it's the holiday season and everybody seems happy, but sometimes it's even natural to feel a little bit of sadness or anxiety going into the holidays. Therapy can be a bright spot amid all of the stress and even possible change in your life. Something to look forward to, to make you feel more grounded and to give you the tools to manage everything that you've got going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this holiday season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA today to get 10% off your very first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnNBA. Today's episode is also brought to you by Game Time because, look, you shouldn't have to worry when you're buying tickets to your next big event. You're trying to go out and have a good time. You don't want to be stressed about how you're going to buy the tickets to get there. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events happening near you. Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. They've got last-minute tickets, flash deals. It's easy to find and buy tickets for every kind of event in your area. They've got views from your seat, so you know exactly what to expect when you get to the the venue. So take the guesswork out of buying your tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off of your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, and redeem code Locked On NBA. That's L O C K E D O N N B A for twenty dollars off of your first purchase. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, Roosh, two of the guys that have largely benefited from the addition of Ime Odoka, and like we kind of predicted, right? Sitting there all summer speculating on what this team would look like and how they would take some steps forward this year, ideally. Jalen Green and Alperin Shingun. We got to start with Alp, though, because he has been far and away the team's best player. He's kind of been their engine a little bit offensively. Things he makes the, the offense go, right? When he's on the floor, good things happen. He's involved in pretty much every play on the offensive end, whether it's him setting setting screens as, as the main guy setting screens, whether it's him as a role threat, whether he's the connective tissue piece offensively and breaking down the defense that way, uh, whether he's posting up and creating advantages like that. He is effective from pretty much everywhere on the floor right now. Uh, and it's opening things up and it's making the Rockets offense has looked really great playing through him, a steady, heavy dose of shin hub, if you will. Yeah, I mean, he's been awesome, man. It's uh, it, it's and back to Ime Odoka. Like, that's Ime Odoka building him up and trusting him, right? It's uh, Shingun and Fred Van Vliet are a one-two punch. Uh, they are Houston's one and two, right? And we'll talk about Jalen Green, but Jalen Green's kind of the number three right now. Um, but, yeah, I mean, look, 19 points a game, eight rebounds, six assists. What's interesting is his blocks are down. Um, he's only averaging 0.4 blocks per game compared to 0.9. In the previous two seasons, and remember, he was a member of the 70-70 club last season. I think one of only three players who had seventy, at least 70 blocks and at least 70 steals on the season. Some people might say, oh, his defense has gone down. But the reason that his blocks are down is because he's actually defending. He's like physical out on the perimeter. Um, and I think the Rockets are playing better defense because they're not relying on him trying to block shots like they were last season. What's really interesting, though, is his usage is up. 24.9, basically 25% usage. Um, in the last few seasons, it was 22 and 21. So he's making more of his attempt or of his time on the ball. He's shooting th uh, 3.2 shots more per game. He's playing more minutes. He's turning the ball over less. He's fouling less. I mean, I, I don't know. He's, I think he's certainly a candidate for most improved player. Um, and it's nice to see that the Rockets are finally leading into him and running offense through him and, and Fred Van Vliet. 
They both have high assist to turnover ratios. Um, and I think you've seen that reflected in the play. And what's kind of interesting is Alpi's only played 24 minutes this season without Fred Van Vliet on the court. And, you know, I got the chance to ask Ime about why that is. And basically, Ime highlighted the fact that, you know, they really love the, the the chemistry that those two guys have together, the way that Fred is able to set up Alp, especially in the pick and roll. They, they've developed a very fast chemistry with one, with one another. Fred can hit Alp with that little pocket pass, and then Alp either scores the ball himself or breaks down the defense from that point on. Um you know, I just would have thought we might have seen a little bit more LP like without Fred out there, just kind of, you know, running the the shin hub, you know, run it through him, that kind of dynamic. But for the most part, I, I do think it's also, and Ime highlighted this, it's also because LP makes life easier for Fred. Like, you know, as a screener, somebody who can create an advantage for him, Fred has the ability to break down a guy, you know, at times, you know, but he's, it does feel like as a smaller guard at times, sometimes, you know, if he's got a bigger matchup on him, bigger defender, it's a little bit maybe harder for him to create that separation, create some space. So having a great screen setter like Al P to free up Fred to get to his jumper, to get to, you know, some wide open threes or let him get downhill and make the next kick out pass that way has been really beneficial for him as well. Yeah, I, and I think that's a good point. I think you're seeing it in the rotations, right? Fred and Shangun play together. They come off the court together. And then the second identity when the bench is in so far, it seems, has been Jalen and Jabari with whoever else is out there on the bench. And I, I kind of like that, right? Kind of like we talked about, Jalen, it's, it's Fred and Alpi are the one and the two, and Jalen's the three, so it kind of makes sense, right? And then, you know, he plays his role within the context of the starters, Jalen does. And then when Fred and Shangun go to the bench, that's Jalen's time to start taking over. So there's kind of a natural flow to how it works. Um, and, and personally, I like it. Um, and also, I, I, I said Alpi's fouls are down and turnovers down. I wanted to point out that's with more minutes. So that's a great sign, right? He's taking care of the ball at a better rate. He's fouling less, but he's playing more minutes. Exactly what you want to see. Look, and you were one of the earliest people to, to be, you know, banging this drum all last season, which was the fact that LP wasn't the issue with the Rockets defense. And, you know, it felt like there were a very, a very few of us on like this vocal minority of just LP is not the problem with the Rockets defense. And now we're seeing that this year. We're seeing... Ime Odoka, who is very much a defense first kind of head coach, and he has leaned into Alper and Shingun, and he has zero issues with the way that Alpi is playing. He's giving effort. He's busting his ass. He's crashing on the floor, chasing after loose balls, trying to make defensive plays. He's leading the team in deflections. And I think it was just because it was a side effect of the entirety of the team last year being so poor defensively. Now you're seeing it this year. Ime's talked about very specifically, he's on record saying that he puts the onus on the guards and on the wings to fight over screens, to make plays from the perimeter, right? He doesn't, it's not all on Alper and Shingun to try and plug up all the holes in the Rockets defense at the rim. That's just, it's it's unfair to have that level of expectation for him. If you have a Brooke Lopez or a Joel Embiid type, sure, funnel everything into them and then let them clean everything up at the rim, be these massive mountainous rim deterrents. That's not who Al P is, but you can still have a good defense, even though you don't have a lumbering big man in the middle. I, I completely agree. So let's talk about three things. Number one, last last season, Kevin Porter Jr., Jalen Green, not good perimeter defenders, okay? So the perimeter was leaking completely. They were just funneling guys in and people, and that's why everyone's been clamoring for a rim protector because they're like, oh, well, I mean, we need someone to block shots. Good defense doesn't rely sustainably good defense doesn't rely on one guy to clean up everyone's mistakes, right? So what you frequently saw with Utah, by the way, with Rudy Gobert, but they had Donovan Mitchell out there on the perimeter just getting smoked. That's part one. Part two, no accountability from Steven Silas, right? So guys could take possessions off. You're seeing it now. Guys do not take defensive possessions off. Jalen chases people around curls. You saw LP at the end of that Pelicans game making the dive. And when he made that second one in the back court, past half court, I was like, oh, man, he overplayed it. I like the enthusiasm, but he overplayed it. But he got up, he got back in the play, got a deflection, and Houston got the steal. Like, these are things we did not see last season. And then third, most importantly, which, by the way, back on point on number two, back on point number two, Udoka's holding these guys accountable, so they're not missing a possession, because they know if they miss a possession, you're getting yanked. We've seen it happen to Tari Eason. Most importantly, point three, Houston's defense last season was designed to have the guards help down at the nail and to have LP back in drop coverage. So they, the, the entire thing was schematically designed around overcompensating for Shengun's perceived defensive weaknesses. Voila, what if you play differently and you hold everyone accountable and everyone's manned up? You have LP switch as necessary. You have LP instead of dropping back, trying to clean up the rim, you have him actually meeting chest to chest, meeting the opposing player out when they get the ball, playing them hip to hip, riding them, right? Physical, in your face, man to man defense and trusting them to do that. And Udoka and staff have trusted him to do that, and it has yielded positive results. 
Who would have thought? And, you know, go, going back to kind of the effort component there, especially looking at last year, LP wasn't without fault on the effort department last year. Now, I, I do think, you know, at times he had some moments where his effort waned or where he would be kind of frustrated, but that's, you know, there were there were interviews last year that he did post game where he just looked so downtrodden, defeated, demoralized because he was just he, he didn't know how to succeed in a system that kind of felt felt like it was at times being built against him. Right. Where defensively he had so much expectations placed on him and Silas kind of tried to put him in a box of like, I need you to play this way. And like, that's just not the way LP can thrive on the floor. Now you've got a head coach who's actually you know, more malleable and has built, you know, kind of, you know, transformed the defense in a way that allows LP to be effective. And we're seeing the results play out in, in real time this season. And it's been really a beautiful thing to see. We haven't had a chance to talk about Jalen Green yet. We want to talk about him coming up and some of the, the strides that he's taken in his game this year, as well as getting to some of the coach of the year odds and, and Emi Odoka's chance to walk away with the award. We're going to get there in just one moment. First, today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. They're the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports because it's just you versus the numbers. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, you just pick more than or less than on two to six players and their stat projections, and you watch the winnings roll in. It's so simple to play. You can make your picks and submit your entry in less than 60 seconds. They've got quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types, which is what makes Prize Picks the the number one daily fantasy sports app. And with basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the Specials League, a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. For example, you can do LeBron James plus Travis Kelsey at a 10.5 combo of three-pointers made plus reception. So if you've been thinking about getting into daily fantasy sports, you've got to give Prize Picks a shot. Go to prizepicks.com slash LockedOnNBA and use code LockedOnNBA for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars again that's pricepicks.com slash locked on nba and use code locked on nba all lowercase for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars prize picks is daily fantasy sports made easy And final segment here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Do us a favor and drop your thoughts on Ime Odoka, kind of your evaluation of him through nine games so far. Let us know what you think about the Rockets' new head coach in the YouTube comments. Now, Roosh, when we look at, you know, covering kind of Al P and the, the strides that he's taken defensively, all that, Jalen has also taken some strides defensively. He's still not you know, an amazing defensive player yet, but the efforts there, the, uh, you know, the attention to detail will come over time. There's still some moments, some breakdowns, some, some lapses that we've seen from him, but by and large, the effort feels, you know, completely different night and day from last season to this year. And then he's also continuing to take some you know steps forward offensively in his game, mainly the fact that he's being utilized in a completely different way. The way that we kind of all thought that he should be used before, which is, hey, take the ball out of his hands, play him off ball, use him you know as a cutter, use him coming off screens, that kind of thing. And it's doing wonders for him because he's getting some of the easiest shots that he's ever gotten in his Rockets career now. Yeah, I mean, look, defensively, he is uh, he's playing much better than I've ever seen him play. And a lot of his effort, right? And then accountability, like we talked about, both from the coach and also from the players on the court. I mean, he's got Fred Van Vliet and Dylan Brooks, and we haven't even talked about Dylan Brooks, but he's had Fred Van Vliet and Dylan Brooks flanking him. And if he's the weak link, he's going to get exposed. So he doesn't want to get exposed. So he's putting that effort forth. And it's nice to see. Um, he's rotating correctly. He's taking every possession seriously. He's playing physically. I've been pleased with him on defense. On offense, um, I've been pretty pleased with him on offense. The, only, the concern for me offensively is that he's shooting a career low, 41.9% from two. Um, my eye test tells me that the mid-range has not been there. My eye test also tells me that he is having a lot of trouble finishing at the rim, um, just statistically. And those have been two things that he struggled with, you know, as an NBA player, quite frankly. So I want to see him improve that. But, um, you know, in addition to that, he, like I said, he's taking 14.6 shots per game which is more commensurate with his rookie season at 14.2 shots per game. Last season, he took 17.9. So he's taken almost three and a half shots less per game um, because he's kind of taken the back seat to Shangun and Fred, but he's had, but he seems to be fine doing it, which is interesting. Um, his efficiency is like 54.6 TS. So it was, you know, it's come down a little bit since that one in 13 game. Um, and he's, he's assisting less because he's scoring more and or scoring, creating more, I should say for himself 
And also because we have Fred and Shangoon. So there's a ton of creation happening. So he doesn't have to do that. His turnovers are down despite playing, you know, 32 minutes a game. So that's nice. Um, I also want to talk about the fact that in that one, in that game where he went one to 13, who was that against? Was it Pelicans? No, that was Nuggets, wasn't it? Nuggets? Okay. Yeah, I think it was the Nuggets. Yeah. He went one to 13, but he was positively impacting the game, right? Like he was doing other things. He was putting pressure on the rim. He was creating for others. He had that great uh, drive and he had that like loop around bounce pass to LP down the stretch where Shangun got the the dunk and one, um, you know, to increase the lead with, with only a few minutes left. Like he's making the right plays. He's getting to the free throw line six and a half times a game, despite playing two, two minutes less than last season. And he's got his percentage back up 78%. I mean, he's shooting 40% from three right now. I don't know if that'll sustain. If that does sustain and if this free throw rate sustains, then I'll be really pleased. But so far, I'm pleased. Um, I just want to see him take, like, that noticeable leap. It doesn't look – you know, it, it looks like he's showing up a lot of the little or more nuanced things, which is really good. I want to see him put that all together with the flashes of star potential to really hit his ceiling. And those those smaller, kind of more nuanced things, it, it kind of matches exactly what Emo Doka said that he wanted Jalen Green to become, coming in, talking during his introductory press conference, all that, saying he wants Jalen to become a more well-rounded player. We know that Jalen can score the ball. And even though there's certain, you know, metrics, the efficiency, you know, you cited the mid-range, finishing at the rim, those are things that he has to clean up and get better at, absolutely. And I, I, at this point, I don't know how Jalen necessarily gets better part of it feels like he he does a lot of like the the finesse stuff around the rim rather than just g driving in strong and trying to finish through contact I will say you cited his free throw rate he's got a career best free throw rate this season 0.443 uh free yep. throw rate this year which is fantastic like that's great he's getting to the line a lot and his free throw rate his free throw percentage is also back up so he's hitting those shots when he actually gets to the line which is really beneficial for him but there's still too many times where it feels like he drives and he's like trying to contort his body around a defender and finish these little like dipsy doodle layups or whatever. And they, yep. they just, they go, you know, they're wild off the glass and they have like no chance of going in. But then there's other times like against the Lakers where I think it was, no, sorry, against the Nuggets. Uh, no, not Nuggets. No, no, I think it was the Lakers. Lakers, you're right, Lakers. you're right. He did like the he cut like through, a, yeah, the little up and under through two defenders that looked like, you know, MJ esque. And you're like, okay, how, why can't do that more? Like that works. Um, and part of it, Ime has talked about this a lot with Jalen is him not predetermining things in his mind, right? Not deciding, oh, I'm, I'm going to drive and, and finish the layup on this player. I'm going to, you know, pull up from it. Like he's got to really get better at the whole reading and reacting thing of his game, especially somebody who is as a dynamic of a scorer as he can be, he has to be able to see how the defense is playing him and adjust accordingly, right? If he has an open lane to the rim to drive it all the way in and do one of those crazy MJ-esque layups, go for it. If the defense is sagging off, you've got to take the mid-range shot. If they're going under on a screen, take the three-pointer. And I feel like Jalen is slowly getting more comfortable understanding and making those decisions. It feels like he's been more kind of crisp and concise in his decision-making on the floor as of late during this Rockets win streak. I think all that's correct. Um, I, I think he, part of the issue with the finishing at the rim, I think, might be because his wingspan is just average and his hands reportedly are not that big. Mm. So he might have, like, when you when you make an MJ comparison, Mike Jordan had long arms and huge hands, right? So once he got to the cup, he could do all sorts of shit with it. Sorry. He could do all sorts of things with it. Um, but uh, the other part of it is he just doesn't look willing to meet defenders at the summit, you know, he only he's only willing to do it if it's if it's in the context of him trying to do a poster and his poster game at the NBA level, honestly, hasn't been that great. Um, it seems like he either gets fouled or gets blocked or misses it. Um, the, he, I mean, don't get me wrong. He has some posters, but for the amount of times he tries the poster, it seems like he doesn't really convert it that that often. Um, but if he was more willing to get up and, you know, meet the defender up at the summit and then contort, take the contact, dip the shoulder and then kind of finish with a little more finesse instead of trying to go up and over or around. He does that little corkscrew where he goes around. If, if he could just program himself to accept the contact at the summit um, and not only when he's dunking. Right. I think it would do wonders for him. But, but look, he, I mean, he looks good. He's polished. He's, he looks polished. He's more efficient. The main thing for me right now is that the three balls falling. If the three ball falls and he's getting to the line like this, we should be okay. Jalen Green is seconded only by Rockets legend Daniel House Jr. when it comes to attempted poster dunks not going in. I So I wanted to say that, but I don't <laughs> want to be disrespectful. But yes, that is correct. Because if you remember, there was a stretch where Daniel House would just try to poster everyone and it never worked, right? So 
Man, yeah. what a what a throwback for the house for the team for the algorithm. Uh, it's y'all know what it is. Numbers up. If, you, if you're if you're an everyday or you know about for the algorithm. Um, look, last thing we got to talk about here. Uh, before we wrap this thing up is is email joke and we talked about him a lot but just kind of the the idea of him you know being in the running for coach of the year he's right now the leading favorite to win coach of the year via FanDuel Sportsbook he's plus 650 right now to win the award and if you had told us this like in the off season that email Doka would be at one point leading the way for the coach of the year honors thing. I would have imagined things are going gloriously right for this Rockets team, which they kind of are after an Owen three start, a nice six game win streak, most recently beating the defending champion golden or well, almost a like golden state warriors. That would have been wrong. Four, Denver nuggets. Yeah. A little Freudian. It's, you know, it's okay. They've won what for the last eight or nine. Like, I mean, it's, there's a 50, 50 shot that they won a title somewhere in the last 10 years. Um, look, I really do think that this Rockets team, so many of these awards are so narrative based, right? I really do think this Rockets team has kind of that narrative where they've got kind of like the redemption arc about them. The organization is is seeking their redemption from the last two or three years of just being the NBA's dumpster fire. Ime is seeking redemption from his, uh, you know, poor exit from the Boston Celtics. Uh, even some of the players on this roster are seeking redemption. Dylan Brooks being ousted by the Memphis Grizzlies. And you look at how Memphis is floundering this season. So uh, jokes on them for getting rid of their one of their best players and basically saying, go away. We don't want you anymore. Um I really do think it's possible. You know, I don't know where the Rockets would necessarily have to finish, you know, in relation to the rest of the top Western six. standings. You think it's top I think, six lock? I think I think I, I think top five is a lock, but I feel like top six because who thought the Rockets were making the playoffs? Yeah. Not the play in, but the playoffs. I don't think a single person had the Rockets making, or not like a single, you know, media person that would vote on this award had the Rockets finishing top six. Um, so I feel like top six could do it. Now, other, so you're, other you're saying you're saying top six, and he's a lock to win it, is what you're saying? I think top five is a lock, and I might be willing to say top six is a lock. Okay. I mean, if Ime Udoka gets these Rockets to the playoffs above, like, with 45 wins or something like that, I think people are going to be astounded. Because um, right. every year there's that coach who, like, takes a team and, ex, you know, far exceeds expectations, right? Like, last year it was – uh, the Sacramento Kings, you know, going third seed and, and Mike Brown and all that was a fantastic story. The Thunder were also kind of that story, but the Sacramento Kings were the better version of that story being the three seed. So Mark Dagnall kind of got the short end of the stick there where it's like he could have been that underdog coach who brought a team and, and you know, really exceeded expectations. So, yeah. So to that point, the competitors, I think, the primary competitors, and, and then we don't know, right? We're like nine, ten games in the season. If these If these results don't hold, then none of this matters. But if these current results are not fluke, fluky and these teams kind of like go at the pace that they're going, you could think the Timberwolves, they're the number three seed right now. Chris Finch. Um, you know, Chris Finch getting the Wolves like back to a top three seed for the first time, what, since Kevin Garnett? I feel like that's a story uh, kind of in the same vein as Sacramento, right? Long drought of being relevant at all and, you know, being up there. We'll see if the Wolves are legit. I picked them to finish, uh, I think, sixth in the West. But, but there's the Wolves. And then there's also the Pacers. The Pacers are seven and four. A uh, long way to go, but they're third in the East, and people love the Pacers. People love Tyrese Halliburton. Rick Carlisle, you know, obviously has the reputation he has. So if he goes in there and, like, turns it around in Indiana, I think those two things, uh, th- those two could be competitors. But but no one expected this Rockets team to be doing what they're doing. So if they continue this, especially with how many people have written off Jalen Green um, and how many people have been critical of, you know, the Harden trade, the fact that the Rockets were considering re-signing Harden, everything, Kevin Porter Jr., Everything that's going on with the Rockets, I feel like would be enough of a narrative to be like, wow, this is a huge turnaround. Don't, what I mean, 100%. And, and you also still have to factor in, of course, the the couple teams at the top of their respective conferences, depending on how dominant they are. Like if the Nuggets manage exactly. to win 60 plus games or the Celtics or Sixers, then you've got to factor in Missoula, Nick Nurse and Mike Malone to just, you know, Billy see, could be one. Yeah. So there, there's yeah. a lot of competition this year, potentially for the award. But if Ime keeps these Rockets looking like a well-oiled machine and if they finish as a potential top six team, like just a lock for the playoffs, not even just completely foregoing the play-in situation I mean, and just getting to the playoffs, I feel like he's got to be at least a lock to be a finalist for the award. I agree. I agree. Um, I mean, yeah. And it's going to be a ton of fun. Correct. It's going to be a ton of fun watching this team La- do do this this season. So. Last last thing I do want to say, um, it is I, I've had look. I, I was I was thinking about it today. We had this four day layoff, right? I think it was the first time since the Harden days that I was just like ready for the next game, yeah. right? Where I was like, man, I want this. Like I'm ready for this. Like, game. You're, like, you're like, like hitting your army, like give me my fix, my Rockets yeah, basketball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Instead of just being like, oh, well, the Rockets put on Friday. I guess I'll watch that. But yeah. you know, <laughs> goddamn it. Um, but last thing I'll say is they're going on a three game road trip. 
they're playing the Clippers on Friday, which report we're recording this on Thursday. They're playing the Clippers on Friday, uh, and they are hungry for a win. They're not, it's not going to be an easy game, and they started to click at the end of their game against the Nuggets. The, the Clippers did. So don't don't sleep on them. AD's back for the Lakers, um, and then hopefully Steph and Dre will be out for the Monday night game. But but these this little LA trip concerns me. So I'm, I'm interested to see how they handle this. We also don't know how this team plays on the road. We don't. I mean, so they're 0 and 2 on the road, and then they're 6 and 1 at home. But they've only played two games on the road, so we'll find out. All right, Roosh, it's been an absolute pleasure having you back on the program. We're going to make this a bit more of a regular thing going forward. Do us all a favor. Tell everybody where they can track you down at. Yeah, man, R-O-O-S-H Williams on Twitter, Roosh Williams, um, Rockets Watch, as you as you all know. Uh, that's, that's where I'm at. Maybe at your local gym hooping. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to do it for another edition of Locked on Rockets. As always, thank you so much for checking out the show. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcast or on YouTube. Just search Locked on Rockets. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Drop your thoughts about Ime Odoka's job so far in the YouTube comments. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball.